First and now is the official BC Lions podcast back again inside of a week until we're up the Coquihalla. Uh, Matt Baker, Nick Kowalski here. Uh, Nick, feels good, baby. What's going on? It does feel good. That beautiful drive is coming up next week. Can't wait to be in camp. We got football coming up. It's just good feelings all around. And while we're talking about camp, um, it's our great pleasure here to welcome a new partner, a new sponsor to First and Now, uh, Tourism Camloops, a longtime training camp partner of ours, is uh, now a sponsor of First and Now. Uh, Camloops, real places, rough edges are embraced as a sign of memories well made and adventures well played. That is the mission statement on tourismcamloops.com, the website. All kinds of things to do. BC Lions training camp, of course. The Memorial Cup is there this year, Nick. Uh, We might get a chance to watch some championship hockey at the tail end of our stay. Uh, Plenty of great restaurants. uh, Plenty of great bars. You love the outdoors. Kamloops is a great spot. Uh, Hikes, kayaking, golf, whatever whatever, uh, your choice may be. Cycling, BMX. You really can't beat it, Nick. Yeah, and then the views overall too. Like the whole the whole province of British Columbia is is beautiful in my books. But Kamloops, you're right in the the valley too. Where we're staying at uh, Thompson Rivers University, which is kind of just right in the middle. You're kind of over top of everything, and you can see all the the valleys around you with the water and the mountains. It's for a video guy like myself. It's it, the the views are pretty fantastic being out there. So, if you were to pick one favorite thing about it, would it be the views? Definitely. This, this year might be a little bit different because the Memorial Cup is definitely on my bucket list. And I'm one way or another, I'm making my way down down there, especially with the Blazers are still in it. So right now the situation is, for the, for everyone that doesn't know, for Memorial Cup, it's the QMJHL, the WHL, and the OHL winners along with the host. So four teams qualify, right? But Kamloops is the host and they're in it no matter what. Yeah, they're, 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 in, they're the- in it regardless. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But they're still alive in the conference final against Seattle. I think mm-hmm. as we're recording this game for us tonight, and they're down two to one in the series. Yep. So the winner plays Winnipeg. So Winnipeg's probably really hoping for Kamloops too, because then no matter what, both teams are in the Memorial Cup, correct? Correct. So if Kamloops makes it to the final, the next round, then the team they're facing is also in, regardless. Yeah, Win- Winnipeg. So, yeah, Winnipeg's clinched. So. So if you're the winner of that Eastern Conference final, is probably cheering for Kamloops in a sense because that gives them the berth. But either way, you want to win the championship of the league as well, the, the Western Hockey yeah. League. So, and I've got a tidbit for you, young Nick. Every time the Memorial Cup has been played in British Columbia, the host I think has won. The Vancouver Giants, uh, Vancouver Giants won it here in 2007. Kelowna Rockets hosted in one in 2004. Um, there was years, uh, the old New Westminster Bruins, it was hosted at the Pacific Coliseum in those days, but they won it. So I think, I think, unless I'm missing, maybe a couple of our older listeners who might remember. And it's kind of funny how it works. Uh, unfortunately for our friends in Kelowna too, Kelowna was supposed to host it in 2020. That of course got wiped out completely. And uh, by the time the next round of bids came out, I know that there were some concerns about the rink in Kelowna no longer being up to standard, but that's Kamloops' gain. Um, and we went to a game there last year. We went to game one of the same, same, same thing, round three against Seattle, right? Mm-hmm. We went, uh, yeah. Rick, Rick Lawlisher took a, a couple of us down. It was a Friday night and Kamloops won that game, but unfortunately lost the series in seven. And a bunch of our players went to some of those other games too. So mm-hmm. that was the night I actually discovered who Logan Stankoven was. And for mm-hmm. those who don't know who he is, he's a, he's a Dallas stars draft pick, uh, maybe more famously known as Connor Bedard's line mate during the world juniors that yeah. they were pretty much a duo in that tournament. So uh, Stan Coven, still the captain of the Blazers. Um, looking forward to seeing him again there and when we go up there for a game. And then they also got o- Olin Zellweger, who was maybe Canada's best defenseman mm-hmm. in that tournament. They sold the farm really to go get him and make a big push of this Memorial Cup. So those are two guys who are going to be surefire NHLers that we get to see live in person before they end their junior careers. And of course, I missed it. Kamloops also hosted and won it in 1995 with a stacked team that had Jerome McGinley and Shane Doan and 
Darcy Don't, yeah. Tucker. I know you weren't born yet, but that's one of the. I know those names. Yeah. I grew up watching those names. Oh, so, forgive me for <laughs> for missing this. Yeah, when it's in BC, good things happen. All right, um, we talked a lot of junior hockey just now, but we we love it. Where it's. Kamloops. It's all the more reason uh, to talk about our partners, Tourism Kamloops, and we're heading up to the tournament capital. Uh, as we're recording this, I think, six days away. Our rookie camp, May 10, 11, 12. The veterans roll in, and then they're on the field on uh, Sunday the 14th. So as we record this, 10 days from now, there's a full-on BC Lions practice, a preseason. Uh, we'll get out of Kamloops actually when the Memorial Cup starts. We'll be out in Regina for a couple of nights preseason game with the Riders. Be back for a couple more, and then it's on June the first. Uh, we will be at BC Place hosting the Calgary Stampeders. More exciting things here: single game tickets for your BC Lions go on sale Friday, 10 a.m. So if you're listening to this, uh, check your watch. Uh, we'll see uh, where you are in terms of that, but. A lot of the pre-sales uh, have gone on sale already. Uh, head to bclions.com. Plenty of exciting game themes. We kicked some of those around last week. Exciting times indeed. Uh, another thing that happened this week, <laughs> almost seems like it's in the rearview mirror now because of everything else that's going on. The CFL draft, your BC Lions coming away with uh, seven new prospects, six of those on defense. And we're going to hear from one of those in just a few minutes. Uh, defensive lineman Francis Bemi versatile player can play the end can play the interior maybe we'll ask him where he is best suited amongst this group of defensive linemen which all of a sudden is getting pretty deep with nationals but francis bemi will join us in a couple of minutes uh, headlining this year's draft class nick yeah and uh i we had the privilege of being inside the war room on on draft night during a part of uh filming arrow up which will mm -hmm. be debuting on sunday the draft episode um, and really to to what Rob Ralph, the director of national scouting and our, our draft coordinator for this draft, was saying about this class that we got with the seven prospects is the team got longer and they got more athletic. And that's a win-win in, in, the, in the football ops books. Uh, they, I know they were very pleased with all the picks. And um, like they were, you'll see on this arrow up episode uh, that's still to come, but uh, the draft plateau they had, they got the guys they wanted. Uh, Francis Bemi. I know the guy they the, the the our management really wanted to get, and they went out and got him, and then they ended up getting uh, five more players on defense, um, some defensive backs, and then also an offensive lineman to cap it out. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a tribute to you know how they feel they are at, at, at certain other positions. Linebackers, we've talked about them being better. Offensive line is probably as good as it's been depth wise in quite a few years for this team, but. Uh, Francis Bemi at nine, uh, round two, number 14, uh, Siraman Harrison Bagayogo, another native, of, another, another native of Quebec, uh, 22 games at Guelph. He was a two-time All-Canadian, um, pretty high ceiling with this player as well. Going to come in, likely battle for some time on special teams, but uh, we saw last year Adrian Green, a draft pick in 2022, uh, earned a spot on the roster as a DB and a special teamer. So, you know, a precedent has been set there. Um, round four, number 34, 34, of course, no third round pick, thanks to the Terry Williams trade. I think that was a gamble worth taking. We can all agree. Marcus Jean Losher out of St. Mary's, another linebacker, uh, 18 games at St. Mary's. If that name rings a bell, it is because, indeed, he is the son of Naughton McKay Losher a BC Lions draft pick uh, in 2004, won a Grey Cup in 2006. So some good bloodlines he has. And this was an interesting part of the draft for me because we knew they really wanted Charlie Ringland, Nick. Yep. Defensive back uh, out of the Saskatchewan Huskies, unfortunately suffered an ACL injury at this year's combine. Now you ask those who were there for that, that was kind of a, a tragic uh, turn of events that went down, seeing that um, play out in person. But, um, perhaps worth the risk in round number five. I know they were maybe humming and hawing about taking a flyer on Ringland at the 34th pick, but sure enough, nine picks later, he was still there. Yeah, the DBs that were selected too, they they got size. Ringland comes in at 6'1", 195 pounds. Uh, Jazz and the State's McLean picked in the sixth mm -hmm. round. Six, six foot two is a defensive back, so just some big defensive backs in that backfield. And yeah, like you said, last season, 
Adrian Green and, and, and Vernon Adams Jr.'s first start at Calgary, Adrian Green was also on the field in the fourth quarter and an overtime on defense uh, playing the field corner spot. Um, so he got some reps in, in games last year and can expect, um, obviously not Ringland recovering from his injury, but these new draft picks, uh, they're expected to contribute in a, in a, in a quick manner. Yeah, and then going over to round seven, another linebacker, uh, Jack Hintzberger out of Waterloo. Um, first team all-star in the OUA this year. And um, that's a guy, maybe he's a year away, but who knows? Uh, you come in, you earn a spot, maybe on the practice roster, you don't rule anything out. And this was a cool part. Uh, last pick for the Lions, round yeah. eight, number 70, Troy Cowell out of uh, Minot State. Is the T silent in that? Do you know? I should know. I think it's Minot. Yeah, Minot, Minot. State. I think Minot State. Minot, yeah. Don't quote me on that. I think you're right, actually. I heard Kelly Bates and Rick Campbell talking about it in the office this week. Um, a native of Alberta. And this was kind of a cool one uh, for me because did you see that there was a full-on draft party for him in North Dakota, which is where Minot State is. And there well, was cheers. Tease- yep. Well, if you want to tease some more Arrow Up content, uh, yeah. you can hear it when, when Coach Rick calls him. You can hear it loud and proud on his draft party. Yeah, so we heard yeah we heard it on Rick's phone, and then uh, there was a news reporter there that tweeted about it, and you could see all, like, hearing it was one thing, but just seeing how many people were there. So we got some love uh, south of the border on draft night. 6'6", 295 pounds, uh, no doubt good measurables. And um, again, uh, we'll see him come in and compete. And you can never have too many offensive linemen or defensive linemen, really, Nick. So it's not a draft if you don't come away with at least one offensive line prospect. Yeah, and I think that was said in the war room, too. They, like you said, you can never have too many offensive linemen. And based on his draft party, he's Troy's going to be someone who's eager and excited to come to Kamloops and compete. And that's that's all you can ask for, right? Yep. So it's always an exciting night. It's a long day, and um, you know we have to mention the global draft here too. Uh, the global draft yeah. was the early part uh, of Tuesday. Uh, just a two-round affair this year. Uh, not necessary. Not as long as last year. We had three. Did it get to four rounds one year? I, I can't. I should. Uh, I should know this without having to look it up. But uh, receiver, a bit of a to talk about a project. Giovanni Robinson. Jamaican-born, uh, this is a guy who pursued a basketball career, played at NC State, played at Barry University, um, actually played a year of pro basketball in Italy, and then decided to give football another go. And it's a player who ended up on the practice roster of the Houston Texans for a couple of, year, couple of years. A six foot eight, big target. So Giovanni goes in the first round at number seven. Uh, the Lions getting a defensive lineman, Junior Ajo, a France native, who ended up playing at SMU. So another one to compete with the D-line, um, Junior Ajo out of France. I would think Giovanni Robinson uh, for sure would be in training camp. Not sure if we'll see Junior this year, but have to get the globals in. Yeah, and and, and for Robinson's sake, like our, our receiver room is is pretty large already. We got Javon Katoy and Domi Grimes already in that group, and mm-hmm. Robinson's going to look... He's, he's taller than them, which is going to be a pretty crazy sight to see at six foot eight. So really looking forward to seeing him in Kamloops. And a couple, a uh, couple of speaking of Canadians, back to that as we're on the draft. So a couple of transactions uh, to discuss, and this one is kind of out there. Is no real surprise. Uh, speaking of receivers, Jacob Scarfone is going to retire, and uh, you had spoken to him. He's going back to school. Is it correct? Yeah, he got into a, a, a highly competitive course or program, and. Wishing all the best for Scarf. He's a really good guy off the field. Um, obviously contributed on the field too. That that backflip touchdown last year against Saskatchewan comes yeah. to mind. So, oh yeah, you know, all, wishing all the best to Scarf and his, his pursuing uh, his his education. That was his second touchdown as a Lion. The first was in 2021 in overtime to extend uh, a crazy loss to Toronto. Uh, what a night that was. We. Won't... We won't relive all of it, but I echo that. Uh, Best of luck to Scarf. Uh, Always good with us content-wise. Always a good contributor in the community, a guy who had made Vancouver his year-round home despite being from Ontario. And uh, there was some talk about Josh Pearson. Uh, Josh Pearson, and Neil McAvoy hit on this in his media availability this week, Uh, still not quite recovered from that meniscus tear. Remember, unfortunate turn of events for him. He... He injured it in practice uh, after making his debut in week three or week four, I think it was, at Ottawa. But going into the game against Winnipeg here in July, 
I did it in practice and never saw the field again. Uh, but he's recovering. I think the plan is to still have him at training camp. I know there was talk about uh, possible retirement with him, but not as of yet. We don't think. And um, remember, he he made a pretty significant play in the only game he played in auto. Remember, he made a big catch, which helped set up Nathan Rourke's big touchdown run to kick off the game, right? So Mm -hmm. a small but big impact. Yeah. And then I'll also add a 66-yard touchdown reception against uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers from Nathan Rourke. Okay. That was Josh Pearson. Yeah, so we did get in the end zone last season. So we got hurt after that Winnipeg game. Okay, yeah. So it was more. Yeah, in the practice, sadly. Yeah, there you Mm -hmm. go. And before before we wrap up on the draft, I want to get one last little note. Uh, we were, we were inside, like I said, the war room. We were inside. We had the office pretty much all day, as as ops was as well. Um, shout out to Tyler Gammon, brought in the Dominoes before the draft. And uh, people who know me know I'm a big Dominoes guy, so I was very pleased. And we 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 actually had to go over. You were in the in the office too, and we had to go over the actual order of the pizzas that we had. And I think Tyler did a good job with with the pizzas that were selected. Well, for starters, I'm sure they appreciate the plug. Good job. And two, yeah, it was quite complicated that there was a specific kind of pizza you were trying to get. But it took, it, you guys were arguing for a few minutes. I was kind of paying attention, but what was that all about? Well, I I, I threw out pet bacon right off the bat. I think that's just a, a classic that everybody enjoys. But for, for actually at Domino's, I always roll with the chicken bacon Alfredo, but that wasn't part of the coupon that he was using. So then I threw out... Uh, tomato and feta as kind of a different option because we already had a bunch of meat options yeah Pretty like good. tomato yeah. feta but uh i got rejected on that one so uh, i think we went to a banana pepper italian sausage which that was good as well i did have some of that and yeah liam thompson was the buzzkill guy requesting the hawaiian that's i don't yeah, yeah. good day to each uh, teach their own but yeah <laughs> <laughs> does not belong on pizza we had a good we that. had a good thing going and then the young kid says oh let's get a hawaiian and i don't did we get a hawaiian i don't think we did in the end we we did not yeah and for for good reason yes yeah you got to uh you got to get the food in on draft night did it last year i think you got me on phil meeting pizza last year i was that i'm not in, pleased about it hey that's um that's probably going to be played <laughs> back at my funeral several years from now so Good stuff. Yeah, it is a fun time. It's a long day. As, as mentioned, we were in there 7, 7.30 a.m. and until 9.30 at night. I know <laughs> I know football coaches, that's just a normal hours in the office for them. But uh, hey, we do a lot of our work at home at crazy hours. We just happen to, to stay in the office. So seven new prospects uh, we expect. Well, perhaps six of them. We mentioned Mr. Ringman uh, going to miss some time with his injury. Uh, that's just another great storyline in camp, seeing how the draft picks adapt, uh, seeing how the draft picks going into year two, see how much they've picked things up. Nathan Cherry, Riley Pickett, we've talked about Adrian Green a couple times. Um, and it's um, it's very exciting. So, And with that, uh, we will bring in Francis Bemi coming up here on First and Now, the official BC Lions podcast. And we've tracked him down, a BC Lions first round pick from Tuesday night, uh, ninth overall, uh, the pride of Southern Utah uh, at his home in Montreal. Mr. Francis Bemi uh, has joined us, his first and now podcast debut, hopefully not the last. Francis, sir, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, thanks for having me on your podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Uh, always love getting to know the new players, uh, specifically the new Canadian draft picks and uh, we'll tell you, we uh, we were in the office when Coach Rick gave you the call when they put the pick in. And, you know, I think at the time, naturally, even though you're expecting it, there's still a bit of an element of surprise. And now that a couple days have passed and it's sunk in, uh, you're no doubt doing a lot of this, a lot of talking. Uh, how's your excitement level? Oh, uh, pretty excited. I think I, I, I think I had a friend that said I didn't seem excited on the call, but I actually, because he called and it was a... Uh, an error code from, I believe, Idaho, I believe. I'm not sure. So I wasn't expecting a call from Idaho to come in, but but I'm definitely excited that it was it was Coach Campbell and looking forward to going down there on Tuesday. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and again, it, it's the shock. Well, not the shock, but just, it doesn't really sink in until it happens, right? I mean, uh, this is a goal you were working toward. Uh, there was talk, and I think Coach Rick even told you that they were pleasantly surprised you were still there at 9, 
what was that first round like as you're watching the picks go by and uh, your name doesn't get called until the end, but you're no doubt excited about where you landed? Uh, actually, like I was just looking forward to like go to the best fit and the team that wanted me, most importantly. So as it was going down, I told myself like just to stay patient. It's kind of anxious because you don't really know where you're going to end up and like you don't get to choose where you want to go, right? So just the fact that it was it was BC that called, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. But it was definitely a lot of nerves, definitely. Based on our research, uh, we know being a Montreal guy, you grew up a huge fan of the Alouettes and you started following them at a pretty good time. Uh, Anthony Calvillo, Ben, ben Cahoon, uh, some guy named John Bowman, who's going to be your position coach. I don't know how much oh, yeah, yeah. you've thought about that, but, um, you know, take us back to your childhood and, and how much you, fun you had getting into the CFL when those guys were doing their thing. I've been following the CFL since like 2009 ish, 10. And that's the time when the Owls was like the golden, the golden days of the Owls, right? They went to back to back, great, great cup. They was always at the top of the Eastern Conference. And I, I grew up watching Coach, Coach it's going to be my coach now, so Coach Bowman. But yeah, I grew up watching him. I grew up watching Antonio Calvillo, SJ Green, Ben Cahoon. I could keep naming them all and on and on. And yeah, so it's going to definitely be interesting once I, when I go down there and play in Montreal, it's definitely going to be really interesting. We were, we were just talking before we started the interview, too, and you said you've never been to even the province of British Columbia, too. So that's another exciting component, I bet, right? Be out here in beautiful BC. Oh, of course, of course. But I never I haven't heard one bad thing yet about BC, so I'm actually really looking forward to go out there. Um, are you into, like, are you are you big into nature with the hiking and all that? Are you a beach guy? Like, what, what do you think you're going to be doing during the summer here? Because you really have all these different options of where you can be outside in the summer. Uh, being in Utah kind of got me into like hiking a little bit. I'm not too big of a hiking fan, but I would say more the beach, maybe a little more than than up in the mountains for sure. And I have and I have to visit Whistler. I have to go out there when when I find time oh. to see how it is out there. Oh, for sure, yeah. And then um, you're obviously joining a pretty a D line that I think was top three in socks last year in BC too. So like you're joining a pretty good group. Um, you also I, I was reading you, you speak fluent French, being from Montreal. So you're kind of the you're kind of the third amigo now on this D line too, with with David Menard and Matthew Betts are our Quebec starters at D line. Um, have you been in touch with them at all, or anybody on the D line so far? Oh, so I actually heard of both of those guys, uh, especially Matthew Betts. Like Matthew Betts is like a, a legend out here. Especially I had a I'm good friends with one of his former teammates, so he's he's pretty much a legend out like out here because you know what he did at Laval and what he did at CVM and all that. So I'm definitely gonna be looking forward to actually meeting him for the first time because I've never met him. By I've known of him and I know of that David Menard too. I've known I've known of him, but I've never met both of them. But yeah, they're gonna be looking forward to getting down there and meeting both of them. Mm-hmm. Let's go back down memory lane here too with with your football uh, life growing up. Like, what got you into football? And um, I, I read too. We can go get into this in a little later. But you you were someone who actually went to America to play high school football throughout your career. But let's start from the beginning. Where, where did your football career start? So my football career started playing at a high school called Dolva Jean Montreal. It's on the on the west part of Montreal, on the far west part of Montreal. I actually started playing football for kind of the wrong reasons, to be honest. Like I I was in detention and had a friend that told me like, oh. You should go try this football thing out. And I just went and fell in love with it and been playing it ever since. And after my sophomore year of high school, I got the opportunity to go play down in California. And I just took it and I went there for two years. And from there, I got originally supposed to go to UConn, but couldn't get into the school academically. So I had to go to uh, Southern Utah. And yeah, I've been there for five years and it's been, it's been some of the best years of my life playing down there. Mm-hmm. That's a great. So yeah, you're you're going to be on the hook for several tickets uh, once we go to Montreal in uh, mm-hmm. September, I believe that is uh, the Saturday of the Labor Day weekend. But um, yeah, so it's clear that it you know it was meant to be in the end, uh, pursuing football, chasing uh, the dream, and uh, and now here you are. Wanted to ask too about uh, where do you see yourself fitting in? I know uh, <laughs> we're not even at training camp yet, and it might be crazy to talk about depth charts and. And all that stuff, but uh, uh, Matt Sakaris, uh, our podcast partners here, Go Goat Sports, uh, he talked about uh, the draft this week, and he was saying what he liked about the pick is that you do have the ability to play at the end. You can play the interior. You know, where do you see your strength as far as where do you fit fit in on the defensive line, Francis? Uh, I think I could play a little bit of both, a little bit. I haven't talked to where they want me at yet, but I'm probably guessing probably at end. 
but I haven't talked to coach where, but I think I could do both. And I, I wouldn't mind playing either whatever team needed they want to play inside could gain a little more weight and play inside if they wanted to play outside could play outside. So right now I'm kind of open to playing both wherever the coaches want me, wherever they think is the best fit for me. I'm open to do it. Let's talk a little bit more about Southern Utah and uh, playing in that part of the United States uh, outside of the football aspect uh, or some of the highlights of living there. Uh, it's it's we li- I lived in Cedar City, so there's not much to do out there. But if you like the outdoors, you would love it. So once in a while, you go on hikes, bonfires, you just explore nature a lot. So that that's 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 mostly what I would do on my on my free time. Just go out to, on hikes or just because there's not much to do out there. So that's what I would do a lot of the time. Now I know you're going to be in football mode pretty much twenty four seven when we get to Kamloops, but. Talking again about tourism, Kamloops, uh, our first and now partner here. I don't know how much research you've done, but there's there's lots of outdoor activities in Kamloops too, Francis. Have, have you looked at that part of it yet? No, I haven't. I just I just know it was in Kamloops after I seen the the itinerary for the flights, and I'm like, oh, we're going back to Kamloops. I haven't really done much research on Kamloops, but I'm definitely looking forward to going down there and seeing what Kamloops has to offer. Read as well that uh, you were raised by your mother. Is that correct? Uh, oh yeah, mom and dad. Yeah, mom and yeah, your mom and dad. Um, other than your parents, who were some of your big role models that had an influence on you? I'll say my high school coaches definitely. Like when I was in when I was in Canada, I had some really good high school coaches. When I was in California, I had my head coach, Coach McMains, and I had my defensive corner, Coach McMain, uh Coach JJ. And uh, when I was at Southern Utah too, I had a uh, coach Ryan Hunt. They they've always like been you know taking care of me, took me under their wing, and took yeah, pretty much like a, a far away from home because my dad is all the way out here, and I'm I'm all the way in, in California and Utah, so I don't really have much family. But definitely, I'll say my high school coaches for sure, and my, and my college coach. During during college, uh, Francis, were there any memorable moments, whether it's individual games you had or, or games the team had or, or places the teams traveled to that stick out to you during your time at Southern Utah? Oh, uh, yeah, a couple. So every every year, except for one year, we would play like Pac-12 schools, right? So bro, you go in the stadiums and the stadium is like 60 plus thousand people yelling. So those those atmosphere I'll never really forget because it, those are like memorable atmospheres, but... Uh, Except for that, just uh, I remember the spring season I won first first team all conference. I think that was probably one of the highlights of my time there. And yeah, I'll tell you, just playing those big games, playing against like top ranked FCS schools week in and week out when we're in the Big Sky. I'll say those would be like the the highlights of my time playing football there. Which uh, Pac-12 schools did you get to go play at? So we played uh, we played Oregon State, Arizona, and Arizona State. And Utah, so for and Utah, we just had an Oregon State defensive lineman on our team last season, Obum Guacham. But now we, uh, we, we, Vernon Adams went to Oregon too, so our quarterback. But oh, uh, Vernon Adams, of... Vernon Adams played in, in uh, before he went to Oregon. He played in at Eastern, uh, Eastern Washington. So that was that was in our old conference, CFL hotbed. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say um, you, must, then... you must have played on the. Sorry, Nick, you, you must have played on that red turf then at Eastern Washington. Is that correct? Yeah, I played on it once. Yeah, that must have been weird. Hey, what was that like at first? It was the it was weird at first. Actually, I kind of liked it, but then I heard some of the players saying like the turf is really hard or something. So they said like if you get tackled, like I don't know. But personally, I liked it. I think it looks good. I really like playing out there. It's a different thing instead of always seeing green, but seeing seeing red is unique. So I kind of like playing out there. And then uh, just for the fans who are getting to know you here too, uh, can you just describe? I like to ask the new guys this too that join our team. But your playing style, like what 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 are what are the fans going to see when when Francis Bemmy's on the field? Uh, I like I got long arms. So I like to use my long arms. Uh, I like to I try to play fast. I try to play as physical as I can, and I try to play hard. I love playing football, so that's definitely what something that the fans could expect from me once I get there. It's just play hard and have fun doing it. Love it. As, as it hit you yet that the, the season's coming up here and in about a month's time we'll be hitting the field for week one of the regular season? Yeah, when I got drafted right after, I looked at the schedule and I'm like, damn, it's, it's coming fast. Like the I think the first game is at the end of this month or early next month. And yeah, it's literally in like four weeks from now and camp's next week. So it's coming really fast, but I'm excited for it. Definitely excited. 
Before uh, we let you go, sir, uh, you mentioned uh, wanting to getting getting to know the coaches. Uh, you talked to Rick, uh, a couple of fellow uh, Montreal natives on the defensive line. Uh, anyone else you talk to? Anyone else you reach out to you uh, about the program here? I know the other, when I got drafted, Bo, Le, I don't want to butcher his name, but I, don't always, I have respect for him. I don't want to butcher his name, but Le, Bo Lacombo, I believe his name is. Yeah. But yeah he, yep. he, he reached out to me, I believe, yesterday. And yeah, just tell me he was excited and couldn't wait until I got there and start working with me. But yeah, definitely looking forward to meeting him once I get there. Well, there you go. Uh, Francis, uh, this has been great getting to know you, and uh, we look forward to doing this again, too. Uh, it's one thing to get the guys on uh, when it's still fresh, but uh, before long, we'll be talking football. And uh, congratulations again. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing uh, how you fit in with a pretty good group on the defensive line. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Francis. Thanks. Excellent stuff with uh, Francis Bemi. And yeah, it's kind of a small world thing. Uh, he's going to be coached by one of the guys he grew up watching. It's funny how that goes. I'm sure that'll make Bo feel a bit old, John Bowman. Yeah, it's a really cool story. And then obviously excited for Francis to not only come to British Columbia, but experience Kamloops next month too. So he's someone who's never been to BC, right? But that, that'll that be exciting yeah. for him. Yeah, and you can hear the excitement in his voice. So uh, we look forward to getting to know him and all the other draft picks, uh, like we said. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about Arrow Up. Uh, the episode three has dropped, Lion Kings part one. We're soon to have episode, sorry, that was episode two. Soon to have episode three, part two of Lion King's camp in Tacoma. We've got some draft stuff coming, and then it's training camp time, baby. But uh, what have you loved most about the Lion King's? Uh, the steak dinner looked fun. Oh, yeah. The the whole Lion King's experience was, was fantastic. Um, I'm hoping that the fans are loving it so far, too. It's, it's really, in my opinion, really cool, kind of never-before-done CFL content in terms of the behind-the-scenes action, literally going inside Vernon Adams Jr.'s home to – see how these guys have fun and interact. And, and like I said, it's a really fun group. So I uh, also got to enjoy some very good meals. There was a steakhouse dinner at Sanford's. Um, cur- that was courtesy of Amar Doman too, who actually uh, got the meal for those guys at the steakhouse. And Vernon, oh, wow. got ch- yeah, Vernon, Vernon brought in some lunches too. There was a Hawaii lunch uh, that Dane Evans uh, paid for. That was some fantastic barbecue food too. So the meals are pretty good and just, overall really fun experience and I'm, hope, I'm hoping you can see that on, on the episodes yeah very good um it's a, again it's a, it's a project we've been wanting to do for a while and take more behind the scenes and and the content's only going to get better as we get closer to week one we're talking about all these dates yeah uh, we're just over a month june 8th in calgary and very much excited uh, for 2000 in 23. Uh, while we're on the topic of content here quickly, um, Evan Tate, intern at a BCIT, helping us with some stuff. He's written a piece on Javon Katoy and his off field job. Uh, he helps at risk youth and Javon, one of those receivers going into year four, a veteran of this team. Now uh, he has also written, uh, has one Evan Tate on miles Fox. Uh, we talked unfortunately about Josh Pearson getting hurt. Well, Miles Fox was initially the the beneficiary of that because he was the American who went on and he got some reps in at defensive line. And uh, we'll have training camp previews. Uh, we'll have rookie camp stuff. All of it. Very much looking forward to it. Yeah, Evan's Evan's been great so far as an intern, and he was with us in the war room or in, or in our boardroom on on Tuesday yes. night for draft night. Where you're uh, sitting also, right now. Yep. Also, also tagged along to the Indigenous Youth Program visits and the tournament all this past weekend as well. So he's been helping out in a variety of ways, and it's it's always appreciated. Well said. Uh, busy time of the year for sports. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, since our last podcast, have slayed their first round dragon, so to speak, but looking to even their series with the Florida Panthers at a game. Uh, Edmonton Oilers. Wow, that's uh, Leon Dreisaitl. Four goals, but it's all for naught as uh, the Vegas Golden Knights took game one. Uh, where do you stand? Do you want to see these Canadian teams win? Uh, I, I don't. I could take it or leave it, particularly. I, I don't need to see the Stanley Cup won by a Canadian team, uh, specifically well, we, if, if it's going to be won with an obnoxious fan base. So sorry, Toronto. Sorry, Edmonton. But 
But we were talking off air about the the narrative that a Canadian team needs to win the cup, but like you like Austin Matthews is American, for example. I never I never understood that narrative of the, the Canadian team bringing the cup home when their captain's not from America, he's from Scottsdale, right? So it um, doesn't really matter yeah. to me, but in terms of entertainment or what I want to see with my uh, my Preds not being in the, in the dance right now, is I, w- I would love to see Toronto and Edmonton play in the cup final, to be honest. I think that it'd be entertaining, first off. It would be, yeah, the, the fan bases would go crazy. It'd be like a little civil war action maybe going on here with the East versus West in Canada. Um, yeah, but, that would be that would be bonkers. That would be exactly bonkers. In a good way. Yeah. In a good way, but, um, and it's what you mentioned um, the nationality and, and origin of you know the birth certificate of certain players. Uh, another podcast I was listening to was talking about the Leafs and the Panthers. Did you know the Florida Panthers have eleven skaters from the province of Ontario? Wow! Like, Did do not you know think that. that you think that might motivate them more against the Toronto Maple Leafs? I would sure as hell think so. And there's there's my point too, where if Florida were to win the cup, that's eleven guys who are yeah. bringing the cup back to Canada, like literally, not figuratively. But they are bringing the cup back to Canada, so I, I think it's smarter to root for a team with the most Canadians on it if you're going for that uh, logic, right? Yeah, well, that year the sh- that year the Blackhawks beat the Canucks, that were one of the years, 2010. Uh, the Stanley Cup came here. Brent Seabrook took it to Tawasin. Uh, my old neighbor Troy Brower took it to to North Delta, Duncan Keith would have taken it to Penticton, I think. So yeah. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Taze back to Winnipeg. Yeah. Back to Winnipeg. Hey, so Winnipeg got to see the Stanley cup, just like we did. That's um, what do you make of the, the your, your Winnipeg jets? There a little bit of controversy of their elimination. Uh, the coach is calling out the players. The players are calling out the coach. A little turmoil yeah, not... there in the peg, Nick. Yeah, it's not the best situation there, obviously, for those reasons. So see what see how they figure that out. They got their whiteout parties, though. They got their two street parties that look pretty crazy. So I think the weather yeah. was fine for them, too, which I remember, I remember when they went on their run a couple of years ago. They played Minnesota in the first round, and they had those whiteout parties, and you pretty much had to wear a parka to it. It was so cold. And then by the time they got to play Vegas in the conference final, you were in T-shirt. It was That's when it kind of Winnipeg in a nutshell. Yeah, even uh, even this year, the shots in Toronto, it looked like a lot of the fans were bundled up wearing hoodies and it looked kind of gloomy. And so, yeah, the further you go, the the better it's it's going to get. Um, have you been you went into the Winnipeg one, you said the one year. What was that like? Was that is that worth it or is it was it a pain in the ass? So if you're really into watching the game not really worth it you do you can watch it but it's not the greatest experience i heard there were some lags with with the the projector this season too but it's a really fun atmosphere so if you're if you're down for that it's 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 probably your best bet yeah if you want to party and have fun and um the last canucks deep playoff run i i was working at the radio station uh, then team 1040 and so was working a lot of nights, but was lucky to go be inside the rink for a few home games. And other than that, I just stay home because 2010 Winter Olympics here in Vancouver, I the gold medal game, it was fun overall, but he said a lot of people, lineups to get a drink, lineups to get a yeah. bathroom. We were inside one of the pavilions watching the, the Canada-US gold medal game. I don't know if I had a do over on that, maybe I'd just elect to watch it at home, but you know, Olympics once in a lifetime, right thing. So. Yeah. And then just lastly talking about atmospheres, just the street parties this year at our Lions games, like they were, they were really, they're a blast to be at. I had uh, the pleasure of being outside live. They're filming them while everyone's having fun, listening to live music and they're going to be back this year. Right. So like I said, the atmosphere at those are, it's fantastic. Backyard Street Party back once again. Uh, yes, reminder, single game tickets on sale Friday, bclions.com. You know, family zone, the Save on Foods family zone, uh, kids for $10 a game, parents for 25 if you're going single game. The sideline seatings, if you want to be up close to the action. The den, if you prefer more of a intimate lounge-like atmosphere. It's all at bclions.com. Got it all. Uh, thanks. Um, got it all. Yes. Uh, we will talk to you. Well, maybe we'll get one of these in before we go to Kamloops. We shall see, but we'll for sure do one from Kamloops. Uh, Nick, it's been a blast, my friend. We're going to Kamloops. Going to Kamloops. Like we never left. 
Shout out to Tourism Kamloops as well. Uh, look forward to partnering with those great folks on First and Now. Until next time. 